to note that today's briefing from the permanent we get a briefing today from the permanent secretary on the implementation of the protocol. I wish to note that it is likely that a, that a further informal meeting on the work being undertaken by the department on exit EU exit will be scheduled before the summer recess, and we will also consider the allocation of the 25 million from the agri food sector in closed session at the end of this meeting. I want to advise that uh, Morris and Patsy will be joining Patsy, the meeting. Patsy's an, an apology, sorry, sorry I didn't. Patsy has sent an apology. Morris has, is joining us via the teleconferencing facility, and Harry, you said William is running late. Is yes. right? He'll be here. And the committee will be recorded and broadcast through Parliament buildings and online. You can use your mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and muted. Um, I want you to refer to draft minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of May, pages 5 to 7. I note that the informal meeting held on the 20th of May, pages 8 to 10, this is, there is one error to point out in this note of the informal meeting, which is the date reads 23rd of April, and it should, in fact, read the 28th of May. This will be amended in the original note of the meeting before publication on the website. Are members okay for the minutes of the note to be uh, okay for the minutes and the note of the informal meeting? Yep. Are yep. we okay to publish the note of the informal meeting on the committee's webpage? Okay, I want to refer you now to the briefing paper from the Department on Border Control Posts Where and the you? Protocol. Right. Just bring them in. Okay, uh, pages two, 12 to 16. A paper by the Cabinet Office on the UK's approach to the Protocol, pages 17 to 40. And information provided by the EU Affairs Manager on the Withdrawal Agreement, Joint Committee at pages 42 to 45. Members may wish to note that we are likely, before the summer recess, to have another informed meeting on the Department's preparation for EU. Exit. I want to refer you members to the table of papers from the clerk at pages three to seven. This list of issues the members may wish to raise during the briefing. I'd like to uh, first of all welcome uh, Permanent Secretary Dennis McMahon, Robert Huey, Deputy Secretary, Norman uh, Fulton, Deputy Secretary Food and Farming, Mark Livingston, uh, Director of the Brexit Contingency, and. Um, We'll start off with Dennis giving a briefing, and then we will follow it by uh, some from questions uh, from, from members. So, Dennis, do you want to just kick off at your? Thank you, thank you very much, right. Chair. And uh, I just wanted to start by maybe adding a few, a bit of uh, additional context to the papers that we'd already sent through. Um, so, I very much appreciate the invite here today. Um, I'm the newly installed, from the 26th of May, senior responsible owner for SPS elements of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and I felt it was really important to have an early discussion with you. Um, I know we throw these words like senior responsible owner around. That means I'm the person who takes the blame for this, uh, you know, at the end, at the end of it. So it's, uh, it is a very serious responsibility. We have a lot of work to do and a very short amount of time to do it in. So basically, I suppose I'm here, amongst other things, to ask for your help in taking forward this critically important work, and I'll maybe come back to that. <coughs> Under the Northern Ireland Protocol, the UK Government agreed that following EU exit, Northern Ireland would, one, continue to align with EU rules on the importation of animals, plants and related goods, and two, form part of a common regulatory zone with the EU. The rules for this are laid down in a piece of legislation, EU legislation, known as the Officials, Official Controls Regulation. Uh, the regulations require that, in order to protect public health and the health of animals and plants, all points of entry, such as ports and airports, into the common regulatory zone must be designated by the EU. The term used by the EU is designation as border control posts to enable checks to be carried out. These checks are referred to as sanitary and phytosanitary checks. I know the committee members will be aware of that, but I think it's worth just saying that, or SPS checks. They're a critical element of the EU's biosecurity programme and facilitate the free movement of goods by helping to guarantee that member states are protected from public health risks and the incursion of animal and plant diseases. So following the transition period, Great Britain will not be in the common regulatory zone and is likely it will be regarded by the EU as a third country trading partner. The EU therefore expects that full SPS import controls will be applied at designated points of entry for all of those goods entering Northern Ireland from GB. It's important to clarify one point here. These points of entry can be existing facilities which the EU designates, they can be reconfigured versions of existing facilities and where ne necessary extension of facilities. So although the word border control post is used, it's actually really talking about a designation and sometimes it's a designation of an existing facility. 
The designation must be formally approved by the European Commission for the type and volume of goods that they will handle. Normally, this process can take six months or more. While there are some existing facilities in Northern Ireland that meet these standards, namely at Belfast Port and the two Belfast airports, they will not be sufficient to cater for the volume and categories of all existing agri-food mov movements between GB and Northern Ireland from 1 January 2021. The Executive has therefore agreed to enhance the existing facilities in order to meet EU requirements and to, see to seek the EU designations of these points of entry. The Northern Ireland points of entry inspection regime currently maintains food supply security and the import and export of live animals, plants and fish. The regime is paper-based, labour-intensive and representative of working patterns before e-certification and electronic signatures became acceptable. The supporting infrastructure, including IT, is not of a sufficient standard. In fact, it's almost non-existent. And we have facilities that don't meet the demands of modern import-export management systems, regardless of the need for changes under the protocol. So it's a good thing that we're doing some of this. We'd appreciate more time to do it, but we, we are where we are on that. There is undoubtedly a need to prepare to deliver against the legal requirements and to avoid as far as possible friction to trade and costs for the consumer. But there's also an important opportunity to support Northern Ireland in sustaining and attracting new business, transforming how we do things and making things easier for current business customers. This will involve digitisation of current processes while delivering significant efficiencies. Again, this is needed even without the proposed changes, but obviously it's necessary for the change, for the, under the protocol. A command paper was published by the UK Government on the 20th of May. This included proposals on how the Northern Ireland Protocol will be implemented. And it's important to note that this was the first time we really had a clear mandate because it was clarity about the UK Government's position. And that, in turn, allowed the Executive to have a clear understanding and, in turn, uh, the Executive and my Minister to agree that I would become the SRO and the Department would take a lead role in making sure that this happens. So we're now moving from inf information gathering to active delivery planning. In anticipation that we will need to move quickly, DARA has established new governance structures. I, for example, chair a new operations project committee of the transition board, assisted by the relevant grade threes. And two of the key people are here with me today. Obviously, we've got Robert Huey, the chief veterinary officer, who you, you'll be familiar with, and Norman Fulton, who again you'll be familiar with from Food and Farming Group, who have key roles on that. And I've also invited along with me my colleague Mark Livingstone here, who's the programme director for this and does the, does the, leads the work. It's important to emphasise that while, there's been some, while there have been some preliminary work, we've only been in a position from the 27th of May 2020 to really develop options for a minimum viable product, which is really a way of saying the basic product to make things work, to meet the requirements of the protocol. Our focus since then is gathering the evidence to understand the trade flows, including types, volumes and timings coming into and out of Northern Ireland, understanding the processes required to reduce friction on trade as far as possible while meeting the legal requirements of our statutory role which is to carry out SPS checks at the point of entry, understanding the IT requirements that will facilitate the movement of trade while seeking to minimise the impacts on traders, and understanding the minimum requirements for each of the designated or potentially designated points of entry to Northern Ireland that will meet EU specifications. We are now collecting evidence to inform the development of options. For example, we have identified that there are approximately 200 lorries from GB to Northern Ireland ferry, uh, by ferry every day, delivering fresh food to our retailers and the majority of these goods are distributed through a small number of large retailers. We therefore need processes and systems to ensure that action, access is as frictionless as possible. They need to support just-in-time food supply, ensure that the quality of our food is protected, meet key biosecurity requirements and align with current and future legal requirements. The design for the work, as I said, is based on a minimum viable product that will meet day one requirements for transition, a product that may in time be developed further. The key elements are redesigning our inspection processes to include local council responsibilities aligning with HM Customs and Border Force, digitising as much of the information as possible, allowing traders to enter details once, using IT systems to undertake as many checks as possible. Use of risk-based inspection methodology aimed at keeping trade flowing in line with legal requirements. Communications to ensure both traders and our staff are aware of the new requirements in good time this will be achieved by developing guidance and training and will also need to improve awareness for staff and traders and development of a user specification for points of entry, highlighting how and the extent to which existing facilities can be adapted, expanded and used to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol. 
So we would, of course, seek to repurpose or expand existing infrastructure as far as possible and necessary. The UK Government has recently restated its policy as priority to support the Northern Ireland Executive to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol. It is the intention of our Minister, supported... Oh, sorry, am I running out of time? Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, apologies. <coughs> I thought you were pointing at me there. No. <laughs> the UK, I'm nearly finished. The UK government has recently restated its priority is to support the Northern Ireland Executive to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol. It is the intention of our minister, supported by officials, to hold them to this. The UK government has confirmed that it will provide the Northern Ireland Executive with support and expertise to deliver the project, but this is not the only support we need. Importantly, the success of this project is not entirely within our control. We will need the help of both the UK Government and the EU to make this work, and they will need to help us work through these issues over the coming weeks and months. Basically, the simpler the processes, while maintaining biosecurity, promoting public health and complying with the law, the more likely we will be able to succeed in our aim of reducing trade friction, and that is in everybody's interests. We are therefore currently engaging with DEFRA colleagues on the following areas, feeding into wider UKG EU negotiations, obtaining specialist advice, working with businesses including communications campaigns, IT system development including performance capacity improvements to existing systems, discussions with the EU to support to secure approval of points of entry by the end of December 2020, and working with HM Treasury to ensure that funding is provided to cover the costs of delivery. For example, engagement with retailers and suppliers has been almost entirely focused on the pandemic and most stakeholders have indicated that they'll struggle to cope with the additional burden of transition. We're therefore developing a plan to engage closely with all key stakeholders, and I have to say that builds on arrangements that we've got at the minute where we would meet the entire agri-food industry representatives from farm to fork every week, every Wednesday. Food supply chains have never been more prominent than in recent times as a result of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, and they have proved very resilient to date. But some 60% of our UK food imports are from the EU, and 70% of the retail food supply to Northern Ireland comes from GP. So, put it bluntly, we all need to make this work. In summary, we have a huge task ahead of us and very little time to accomplish it. Our delivery assessment at the minute is red amber, and the gateway definition of this is successful delivery of the project programme is in doubt, with major risks or issues apparent in a number of key areas. Urgent action is needed to ensure that these are addressed and establish whether resolution is feasible. That means we will need to work very hard and to take all the help that we can get. We will need the UK Government to continue to provide the support that it has promised, and we will need to work with all of our partners, including the ports, local government, the Food Standards Agency and Customs, to deliver a pragmatic approach that secures public health and biosecurity within the statutory framework. Finally, I we will need your understanding, support and goodwill, hopefully, and, and scrutiny. The timelines mean that this will be hugely challenging, and we will, um, it will not be a smooth process. We might as well be honest about that up front. So having people uh, respectfully marking our homework in a way that helps us to move forward will be essential, because you know, it's quite easy in the middle of a project like this, where you're running at 100 miles an hour, to miss something. So this is where we really do need that help. Um, and we, we will have our own project structures as well, but I think the committee will have a great role in this because you'll hear a lot of things on the ground. Furthermore, as the process continues, the situation will change, and we will need to come back to seek, to seek your views and help at those key points of the process if we find out new information. But in the meantime, I hope that this has been a helpful overview, and we will be happy to take questions on any issues that this has raised for you. Um. Thank you very much, Dennis, for that uh, comprehensive briefing. And no doubt people will have questions they want to ask because this is, uh, you know, coming on top of the, the COVID pandemic. This is uh, the last thing people need, but it's, it certainly is a very, very serious issue. I suppose the, the question I want to ask you, uh, Dennis, obviously the EU has to designate the various ports here uh, for approve them effectively for entry into market and for exit as well. Could you give me? an update of where the ports are, like Larn, Bourne Point, Belfast, where are they in terms of moving towards that designation? Because I've noted from the briefing papers that we received in advance of today that one of your next steps in the committee is understanding the minimum EU requirements for designation. So are you, 
are you completely clear exactly what you need to bring those ports up to scratch? And could you tell me where each of those ports are right now and the likelihood of, of, of getting them everything in place in time? So, so Robert's itching to get answering this, but I, what I will say, I, <laughs> I, can, feel him, I can feel him beside me there. Um, so what I, what I will say is we have, from the minute that we had the go-ahead to do this, we arranged urgent meetings with the ports. We've now had meetings with uh, Larne from last week, uh, Belfast and Warren Point, and we've got further meetings planned in the coming days. Now, those meetings have been detailed discussions, but they are a starter for 10, because I suppose, again, the, the command paper and the subsequent agreement of the executive on the back of that, really, that gives us the freedom now to have a proper planning session with them. So, uh, to answer your question, they're, they're aware of what we need to do. Uh, they're, you know, we're going we're to work with them to get those applications through. And um, the process, Robert will be happy to talk through a bit more about the, the process of doing that. Um, but you know, basically, what we're doing now with them is we have we've had initial those those are, haven't just been meetings; those have been planning sessions. We've had large numbers of people around. We've had the councils in um, as well into a number of those, and the idea is to really get people to start planning. So we're already there. So Robert, do you want to say a bit more about then what's involved next and how we take that forward? If we could just take it back a wee bit to set expectations. <coughs> As a recognition chair, deputy chair, that a smooth transition, a smooth end of transition, is no longer possible. That can't be delivered. So let's start with that realisation. Um, so what we're looking about and what Mark's <coughs> programme is trying to deliver is a minimal viable product to keep product moving, to keep food on shelves uh, on the 1st of January next year. So that's how serious it is. Do we know what we need to do? Yes, we do, because it's all codified. And it's all codified in the official control regulations, 2017, 625, and, uh, and a couple of other delegated acts. So the detail, the exact detail, down to number of toilets, uh, literally, number of inspection rooms, number of places to wash your hands, the separation that's required, it's all codified. So we know exactly what uh, a minimum viable product looks like. Uh, the last date to go to the Commission to ask for, uh, to expect them to do the work that they would need to do to designate uh, the border control posts was the 31st of March. But they have given us an extension and an exchange of letters, which I think you've seen between the CVO UK and the Commission. Uh, they've given us an extension through to the end of June to, pro to provide them with uh, outline drafts of what border control <coughs> posts we wish to designate, which ones we have, which ones we're going to extend, and which other ones we think we need. And that work has to be done, in effect, by the 23rd or 24th of June in order for that then to go through a, a Whitehall process. Um, so the, the process that that, that that entails is that um, we get to a stage in the project where Mark makes a recommendation to me that he thinks we're there. I write to CVO UK, she writes to the Commission. And the Commission in the legislation uh, take, can take three months to consider that. Uh, and then they may or may not in the legislation decide to come and do a visit, they will visit. <laughs> they will not just wave us through. And that, that's, a, a fish, that's a visit under the Commission's external controls uh, process, and they will come and, in the phrase that Dennis has used, mark our homework as to how we've done. Um, but we are, we're hoping that they'll mark our homework about the designation of the border control posts in the light of where we are, where we're going. To be frank, if the politics are wrong, this could be an exam we can't pass. If the politics are right, I'm confident that we can get there with a minimum viable product. But this will not be bells and whistles. This will, this will probably be temporary buildings. This will be um, identifying the space that we need in the ports and making the best use of it to fulfil the requirements that the Commission have of us. Uh, but there's none of this easy. Um, but I have said that I've been very encouraged by the contacts that Mark has organised so far with each of the ports, and maybe he wants to cover a little bit, he can cover some of the detail <coughs> of that. He says, look, making sure he's looking in the right direction. <laughs> um, Mark, do you want to cover yes, a little bit of the detail that. of the ports? Yeah, of course. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Um, so, 
Quite simply, we're putting together a programme team, um, as Dennis has described, um, and I'm the programme director for that. And we have a range of work streams and port capacity. Um, prior to the 27th was one of those work streams where we're doing quite a bit of work in the background, looking at the designations for each of the ports. So we have to enhance or expand the designations at most of the ports. And the ports we're considering are Belfast, Larne, Warren Point, Foyle, and the three airports. Um, so I'll just talk through Lauren as an example, um, because it's just just a, a it's a complex example but simple. So currently, um, most of our live animals, if not all of our live animals, come through Lauren, and we do have food coming through Lauren. For example, Asda's delivers most of its food um, through Lauren. Um, in the current EU uh, regulations, if we apply OCR, food cannot come through Lauren because Lauren is not even designated as a as a border control post, um, so it's not designated as a point of entry. So that's the difficulty you can see see right there. So we've already met with Lauren, as, as the Secretary has indicated. We've had an initial meeting, an initial planning meeting, uh, outlining, our, outlining our proposals to designate Lauren as, as a point of entry uh, and the requirements to do so. Um, we followed that up with a quick workshop to get into the real detail and the weeds of what needs to be done, what, what can be done. And I have a, a series of architects and engineers out today working, working around with my Workstream lead to identify which buildings could or couldn't be used uh, and what facilities can be used to allow this infrastructure to be considered. So that's the sort of pace we're working at. So we had the meeting with Lauren last Friday and we've already had three meetings, three fairly significant planning meetings to seek about developing a plan for implementation and delivery, um, which we need to really have in place by the middle, middle third week in June. And we'll repeat all those processes or that process for each of the points of entry as we go through. So the team has been stood up now to work on seven days a week, um, given the pressures that, that we're working to, and has been supported by by the right people. Um, and we're engaging with all the key stakeholders. But I, I, I would propose, Dennis, with your permission at some stage to, to write with you uh, with the details of that, um, because it's quite a complex process. We're working at 100 miles an hour um, just to get all of this done. But there's a real will and a real want uh, to do that uh, and to meet the ministers, I suppose the ministers, expectations that we support, support the commercial entities of the ports as they exist at the minute. So there's a real opportunity as well um, to, to, to achieve something really good from Northern Ireland here. And Mark, uh, are the ports, you mentioned Lauren, what's the status of the other ports of entry? Belfast is, is a designated point of entry, but doesn't cover all, all the key aspects. For example, Belfast, and I don't want to use too many technical terms because I don't fully understand them all myself just yet. But Belfast doesn't, the point of entry doesn't include uh, ambient foods. So all the, all the food that comes in from Marks and Spencer's, Tesco's, etc., would not be covered um, if that Belfast didn't redesignate and expand and enhance itself as a point of entry to cover that sort of thing. So that's the detail we're getting into. Uh, and I have a, a third planning session with Belfast on Monday to get into the detail of that and repeat the process for Lauren. Okay. Um, before we just move around again, one of the um, one of the key things, obviously, the the British government says that they'll work with the executive to make all this happen. Most important question is who's going to pay for it? Well, they, there's um, there's some helpful words, although not a check, in the uh, the document um, where they do talk about working with HM Treasury to get us um, mm. additional resource for this. Um, we are taking the view that uh, this has to be done. Um, I've now written twice to officials in uh, DEFRA, so DEFRA would be our main point of contact with UKG, but obviously we also put it up through mm -hmm. central government and um, central uh, governance structures in TEO as well. Um, but the, the, um, basically the intention is if there's money need, needed for this, we would, we would be seeking support from Treasury. Now, whether we get that or not, uh, and how much of that we get, I suppose to be, to be fair to everybody, it's important to scope it out properly. So really, over the coming weeks, Mark says there's, uh, as, and as Robert's talked about already, we're talking about there's the applications, which are right up front. In order to put the applications in for designation, we need to have a good sense of the plans. And at that point, then our costings will be better. Um, but, you know, I have to say the costings are probably, um, you know, we're, what we're looking for is a streamlined, it has to be as streamlined as possible here anyway. Um, because I think that's what everybody wants. And a big part of this, I suppose, it'll, where, where the two things interact is how simple the processes are. And this is where the negotiations play into this. The simpler the processes, the easier that makes it. Notwithstanding, as Robert says, there are very specific things that need to be built in, but it just makes it easier. 
um, because, you know, for example, that there will be less delays. So. Yes. I'll go and move around the members here. John? <coughs> thank you, Chair. And can I thank Dennis and the senior team for bringing us this um, amount of detail today? And I think uh, I'm obliged to comment that it's given me much more detail than that which I've been able to glean through various assembly questions, um, uh, written questions, and attempt through through the minister's office to get information about uh, infrastructure required for this protocol. So at least I, I'm better informed than, than I was um, after my, my previous attempts. But but it brings me not, not simply a few concerns. For example, page 15 of the report. The, detailed report tells me that the DERA transitional operational delivery team started work on the 27th of May, uh, and that, that work was initiated to deliver the, the um, MVP, um, and the next steps are apparently gathering evidence. I need hardly remind you, Chair, or, or those present of the fact that we're halfway through the year already and the deadline is December. Um, so the question is, and I think Robert alluded to it there slightly a moment ago, but I need to ask again for clarification. Is this simply a serious challenge, if such a thing could ever be called simple? Is it doable at all? And to drill down into some detail, can I ask that these are very important matters to me. Um, what resources have been dedicated already to delivering this? And where are those resources brought from other frontline services? Will additional resources be available? And I'm speaking specifically of staffing resources required to deliver these frameworks. Or will that staff resource also have to be brought from existing DERA services elsewhere? Is the funding available? And I think I'm obliged also to ask how much of this is the result of the fact that it was only in recent weeks that the UK government even acknowledged the need to set up this infrastructure in relation to the protocol. And if that clarification had been brought earlier, would we be in a better place? Um, could I chair through, through yeah. the chair? I can, I can answer a few of those. I think I'll start with your last one first. And obviously, this is a, there's a realm of this is politics, and therefore it's not appropriate for me to comment in, uh, in too much detail. And also. Um, I'll, I'll not defend the Minister's position, but it's my job to explain the Minister's position. And the Minister's position was very clear, and uh, for that matter, I suppose, um, the Executive's position, in a sense, was clear that you needed to have clarity around this. Um, and actually, that's still the case. So, for example, if, if I give you a very real example about this, if we have um, a, consign a set of consignments in a lorry, and those, uh, each of those consignments requires a separate export health certificate, and you just apply the processes in a very straightforward way. Depending on the, type, the, the sort of way that a lot, some of the businesses run at the minute, you may have hundreds of consignments. Now, how, in, with whatever infrastructure and whatever processes you put in place, how you could get that to work and avoid friction and trade is difficult to see. So there's still things that we need, still points of clarity. But the minister's view was that uh, he wanted to make sure that we were in a position that... Uh, we had commitments from the UK government uh, as to what was going to be done to make sure that those kinds of frictions would be avoided as far as possible. And his view was, while I, I, I don't want to speak for the Minister other than to say that while it's not perfect, that there were some effect, there were some concessions in there that were helpful. Um, and it certainly some of the clarification was not just helpful, it was absolutely necessary because you cannot start a programme like this unless you've got agreement. Now, then come to the resources, and I think Mark's hinted at it already. We've tried as far as we possibly can um, from day one. If you look at our first day brief, this was one of the issues in our first day brief. Um, and we've tried as far as we possibly can to take, um, you know, to do what we could uh, without cutting across that very, uh, that, that clear political line. Um, and uh, that we did do that as much as we could. In fairness, I have to say COVID did have an impact on that. So, for example, we could have had conversations with the court ports with, without prejudice around planning, um, but we could only take on that so far. So we have been gathering whatever information we could. We've been building up a team. We're now ramping that team up very, very rapidly. Um, but as I say, it's not that we're just... It's not. And, and, but, but I think it's important to say, and this is why we put it in there, 
The project doesn't start till it's got the pro it's got the approval to start, and that's why I've been very clear about that. So we've had people working, doing what they could, working behind the scenes as far as they could, within the constraints, but um, we couldn't actually start the project. So now we're moving straight into the okay. Let's have an adult conversation about what's involved here and what do the plans look like. Um, will that have an impact? I suppose it, it clearly we're already taking resources, so Mark's got people arriving by the day and uh, is building up a team and we're using our best people to do the planning and the design work. They're all good people in Dara, uh, but I have to say we're just bringing people who've got the skills and the, the expertise in. And um, that, that does, as the SRO, that gives me enough confidence. If it was red, I would say it was red. I mean, I've been open today about the fact it's red amber and uh, it could go red. I mean, if we don't get a bit of uh, leeway uh, on some of the support we need from UKG, then it will go red, and I will say that, and I will tell the committee that, um, and then we'll have to think about other contingency arrangements. But I'm confident that we've got really good people in place. I'm really confident. I've personally chaired the meetings with the ports. So the fact that I'm involved in this, and I will be involved in this, kind of gives you a sense of the, as in this role, it's not often that you'll get a permanent secretary doing this for good reason, for a number of reasons, but the reason I'm doing it is because this for me is a top priority for Northern Ireland. Um, and that, that, again, so that's, I'm, I'm confident, but I'm confident on a red amber basis, right? Um, so there's some big things that need to be sorted out. Um, it will have an impact then in terms of the actual running of it. Um, but I think we're, again, we're planning, we're planning ahead. Again, some of that will depend, all, a lot of it depends on the process. So we know how many lorries come through. We know some of those lorries have very <coughs> mixed consignments at the minute. And um, that, that then determines your, your staffing numbers. But that will, of course, mean we'll have to find ways of staffing that. But I'm not, Robert can tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm not as worried about that right now. My big concern now is getting the plans in place, getting the applications in, and, you know, and, getting, and actually getting the IT there. Um, but the central point is getting the support from UKG and in the negotiations with the EU for a pragmatic approach. I don't know if that's helpful to you. And Robert, I don't know if you want to add anything. Just to put it in common parlance, my boss before Dennis, when I burst through the door into him with some big problem, he'd look up calmly and say, have you an issue, a problem, a big problem or a crisis? A big problem, but it's not yet a crisis. I think it's about where it's at. <laughs> it's about right. That summed up very nicely, Robert. Um, all right. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Well, um, first of all, thank you to Dennis and Mark and Robert and Norman. You're part of the furniture now. So. <laughs> Basically, um, most of my questions are adapting what you believe you've asked. So just maybe a wee toady bit of clarity on it. Like EU has designated all the areas that's nailed down, finalised, or would that still be fluid? Can there, could there maybe? Um, add in a few more or think and they've basically as well as that they've told you exactly what to expect of you and we have to supply it and then they'll come and check it so just a wee tiny bit more clarity but Robert can it's a little bit insanitary and phytosanitary but just think of where this takes us to um, it's got its roots in WTO so after you've done a trade agreement uh, the WTO allows any trading block or, or country to bring in additional measures to protect animal health, plant health, or public health, or animal welfare, in fact, now as well. So, for example, if the EU um, didn't wish to bring in, uh, had difficulties with foot and mouth disease or African swine fever uh, concerns about another country, they have a legitimate reason for asking for additional guarantees or to put other things in place in order to ensure they didn't bring those viruses in with the meat. So the, so. The easiest way to think about this is that um, Northern Ireland, uh, along with Ireland, is, is, all, is all now part of an EU single market, uh, which is different uh, from that in GB uh, after we leave. So the EU wishes to protect its animal health, public health and animal welfare. And the whole SPS control regime is about that. It's about nothing else. It's about protecting the, the animal health and public health, animal welfare, and plant health within the European Union single market. Now, on day one, obviously, the standards are exactly the same. So the risk to the single market from Great Britain uh, is minimal if it exists. 
but as the GB derogates from EU standards or brings in products through trade agreements from other countries that don't meet EU, then the effort will be to try and keep those materials out of Northern Ireland. And that's what the SPS, the border control posts, the whole thing is about. And that's the easiest way. The scope is very broad. It's not just animals and food of animal origin. It's high-risk uh, products not of animal origin, such as feeding stuff. Uh, th th there are big concerns about that and alpha toxins and things. It's fish, it's shellfish, it's manure, because there could be a risk with it. It's not just livestock and horses, but pets and, and live fish and aquaculture. So it's a hugely broad um, um, scope within this. So the border control posts that we bring in are, are we ask for designation of are specifically for specific products. So the one for livestock, for livestock, farm livestock, doesn't cover you for horses. That's a different designation. It doesn't cover you for pets. It doesn't cover you for commercial pets. So there are a number of designations that we have to work our way through, work out what our minimum viable product is, what can we actually deliver. And for me, the priority at the moment is to be able to bring in fresh food and live animals on day one. Now, there will be all sorts of problems that we can't bring in animal byproducts and all sorts of other things, but my priority uh, sitting here today is to ensure that we have that we can keep fresh food on shelves, so those 200 containers uh, uh, a day that come in through Larne and Belfast, uh, that they can continue coming in and serving the supermarkets, uh, and that livestock can come through a, a border control post. So those are my two big ones. Um, there already are designated ports for plants to come in through the airport. That's your flowers from all over the world, um, all that stuff that comes in, and, and, that, and that's very good and very useful to us. Um, but I come back to it. This is, not, this is difficult. This is where, not, where you wouldn't plan to be. Um, but the cooperation we're getting so far, um, both from DEFRA and from our own folks in the industry, uh, this is doable. But I'll come back to it again. There are things outside our control. If the politics get in the way, the politics get in the way. Negotiations get in the way. Um, get in the way. But you know, we'll do what we can do and control what we can control. I mean, could I, could I just sorry? Could I just add a word to that? Just to say, and I just I don't want to appear. I, I, we've, we've been very honest with you, um, but I don't want to appear negative about this because actually there is opportunities in this as well. We get this right. If we can get this right, there's a real win-win in all of this, and that's where your question is a good question because there's opportunities then to expand it in the future, and there's opportunities for the ports, there's opportunities for other businesses. It's like anything else; there are real good things that could come out of this. But just want to get through the next six months first. And uh, three weeks. Well, three weeks. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Very helpful. Thank I've you. brought it down again anyway. But okay. <laughs> thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for your confident answers. Very good. I mean, your number one thing is obviously that we'll have food on the tables, and that's the most important thing. And as you say, I emphasised there from day one, literally we are the same. It's as time goes right. on. So, yep, very good. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right, Rosemary. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sort of going to drill a little bit more down into the movement of goods um, between Northern Ireland and England, etc., and backwards. Um, if you look at page 29, it talks about trade going from Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK should take place as it does now, and there should be no additional processing of paperwork, and there's no restrictions on Northern Ireland goods arriving in the rest of the UK, that is. In other words, there's unfettered access as provided by the protocol. So my question is, does this mean that goods that are does this mean that goods that are coming into Northern Ireland from the Republic or any other EU country via the Republic will have unfettered access then to GB without restrictions? So in other words, goods coming from Republic into Northern Ireland, and then them moving through Northern Ireland into England. Well, um, I wouldn't mind deferring to a colleague in the corner here, Norman, if you were happy enough to say a few words about that, because that might be... Yep. Uh, the issue of unfettered access is for Northern Ireland uh, and Northern Ireland only. Uh, so therefore, if product is moving through Northern Ireland, uh, say from uh, this one, the command paper from, uh, from GB through Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland, then effectively that 
should be no different than product moving from GB across to France. Uh, so therefore, if there are tariff issues involved, that, that uh, should, should, uh, should apply. So therefore, the issue of unfettered trade between Northern Ireland and GB is exactly that. It's for Northern Ireland. Uh, now, there is an issue around, still to be defined, uh, around uh, uh, the designation uh, of, of the per permitted goods, uh, a Northern Ireland good, uh, and that still has to be addressed. Uh, but later this year, there will be set in legislation a, a legislative definition of uh, unfettered access, what that means, and that has been a commitment given by UK government, so we will have full clarity uh, around this issue. So un unfettered access is for Northern Ireland. For Northern Ireland. So goods come from the Republic, through Northern Ireland and England, there's unfettered access. No, that is, uh, is it should be the process should be no different than going directly from Dublin uh, to GB. So it's uh, or from France to GB. Whatever the processes are, whatever the tariff regimes may be, uh, if it's yeah. from Nor uh, Republic of Ireland through Northern Ireland to uh, GB, the product is coming from the Republic of Ireland. Yes, and that is not. Uh, then captured within unfettered access. Yes. Unfettered access is for Northern Ireland only. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then, page 33. These arrangements will not cover goods travelling from Ireland or the rest of the EU being exported to Great Britain. The UK's custom and regulatory regime apply to EU goods and businesses exporting to GB, mm -hmm. subject, of course, to any preferential treat items or terms we agree through the free trade agreement. How do, they, how do you find these goods if there are no checks for goods going from Northern Ireland to GB? Yeah, I think... You know, if you've goods going to, on to the Republic, you know. No, I mean, to be honest, it's a, it's a really good question because actually um, the, the UK government's command paper has been very, very clear about, about this uh, issue of unfettered ac access in the direction from Northern Ireland to GB. There are questions about, for example, um, and again, maybe maybe some of this has moved on, but there certainly have been questions about to what extent um, something can be considered a Northern Ireland product, yeah. because everything's so interconnected and supply chains are so interconnected. And um, I think, uh, you know, so so uh, I suppose all I can go back to is the command paper. And uh, it talks about um, unfettered access for Northern Ireland business to the rest of the UK, page 10 of the command paper. And uh, no import customs declarations, no entry summary, no tariffs applied, no customs checks, no regulatory checks. We won't be doing any of those checks. So uh, what else um, GB puts in place in due course will be a matter for the UK government. There. Yes. The, general, the, the rule is that the imported country sets a standard. So GB, as an independent country, will set its own standards for import checks to protect its own animal health, public health, its own tariff regime. I believe that there is another paper coming out of Whitehall in the next few days that will lay out for my area for SPS what checks uh, the UK government are intending for imports from European countries how they're going to do it, how they're going to do it in the short term and how they're going to do it in the long term. Because obviously there's a lot of preparations to be done there and more border control posts and additional infrastructure they would need in order to do that. Um, and to cover the piece that you talked yeah. about, Rosemary, there of, of coming through Northern Ireland. So the answer is we don't know yet because we're still waiting for almost an equivalent of the command paper to deal with imports from the European Union into into Great Britain, and I'm not sure at this moment, and I won't probably until I see it, whether that covers uh, Northern Ireland into Great Britain. Okay. The paper pending. The, you hit the nail on the head. That's yeah. exactly the question. But yeah, that's no answer. That's the, no, at this stage, not for us. But I think, having said that, from a Northern Ireland point of view, there's great reassurance in the clarity for Northern Ireland businesses of unfettered access, but it does create a, a, a challenge of how you separate that out from other yeah. products. And clearly, you know, it would be important to do that so that we don't find our businesses disadvantaged. Yeah. You know, that's uh, okay. oh, um, it. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, two more. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. The ne next one. Um, <laughs> tra 
I've read this through. Trade um, going from the rest of the UK to Northern Ireland, it's not, it'll not, le- there'll be no levy or tariffs on goods remain within the UK custom territory, which is okay. Only those goods that are ultimately entering Ireland or the rest of the UK or at clear and substantial risk of doing so will face tariffs. Mm. Okay? So, how will goods entering Northern Ireland be checked to establish whether they remain in Northern Ireland or are going into the U- EU via the Republic? Well, that'll be one of the processes we will be looking at as part of the, the as you know, we talked about the systems that are being set up and the information systems that are being set up. So we'll be we'll be looking at that as part of it. I don't know, Mark, if you want to say anything on that. No, that, that's basically it, Rosemary. So the process that we're developing at the minute will include customs clearance and be part of that declaration as as the as the goods come across. So those processes have yet to be developed. And we're working, we're working closely with HMRC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, maybe you could just add here, there, there are two separate issues here. Uh, there's when product is coming within the regulatory zone of the, uh, of the EU, so that's it, it, it passes the SPS check. It can go anywhere from an SPS perspective. It is, it is past the, uh, the requirements of entering the EU regulatory zone. Customs is a separate issue. Yeah. Uh, and it's a separate control. So uh, the product may move on through uh, Northern Ireland, and therefore that's when it becomes subject to uh, a customs procedure. Uh, if it stays within Northern Ireland, within the UK customs zone, it, it doesn't, uh, and that's what the, the command paper. So there are two separate, although connected, uh, issues. Um, there's certain overlap, but you have to remember that they are separate concepts. Yeah. That would be worth um, Robert saying a little bit about the connection, Robert, if you're happy enough. It's, Sorry. It, it's our aim and our process, which Mark is working through, to ensure that there's, well, there, there is a common entry document and that the enforcement authorities, whether that's ourselves or, importantly, HMRC, Border Force or any other, that we all work together so that there's a single one-stop shop and the existing European okay. systems are, in fact, set up to enable that to happen. So, actually, the authority that controls the movement and finally releases a consignment from a border control post is, in fact, the customs, because they have the legislation and I don't. So, you know, they, they, we all identify that they, on, on the system that a consignment is coming in. Uh, we identify if we need to do checks on it and what checks those are. Uh, and, but it's the customs who finally say, you're, you're OK to go and enter the single market. They have control, so we want to work together. Yeah, the reason I'm asking that is because in Fermanagh we have a steel fabrication um, business, and you know you, the steel's coming in from Northern Ireland. Our steel's coming in from Great Britain. It's been fabricated in Northern Ireland, and some of it is then moving into the Republic, and that's where the issue will be. And this is where the, the, com- the discussions at the Joint Committee will be so important mm-hmm. yeah. around that. Yeah. And the last, last question I want to ask is about the agri-food that's produced as a raw product here in Northern Ireland. And it goes to the Republic for processing and then goes to GB. How is that dealt with? So it goes, it's raw products here, it goes to the Republic for processing and then it's going back into GB again. It, as far as SPS is concerned, it's coming from the single market and it's being imported into GB. It's up to their controls, but I can't see why it would be anything other than unfettered, why there would be any controls fired on that. From the Republic back in, yeah. I think the other thing you have to remember is that, that trade will be critically dependent on the nature of the, the agreement between the UK and the EU yeah. in terms of the trade talks that are, that are ongoing uh, as, as we speak. Uh, and therefore, I suppose the answer to that question really depends on the outcome of those trade uh, negotiations. If there is a zero tariff, zero quota trade arrangement between uh, UK uh, uh, and EU, then these issues don't emerge as a problem. Uh, so it, it, it is critically dependent on the nature of that, that trading arrangement uh, agreement that uh, eventually uh, emerges. Thank you. Okay. Um, Philip? Thank you, Chair. Uh, that was very useful. 
some of it was very stark actually in terms of the information provided but appreciate uh, the, the information and uh, I mean I noted the other day chair that one of the other departments committees wrote to the British government regarding issues around Brexit including uh, the issue of an extension so that might be something that we as a committee could uh, consider doing in terms of questions because uh, a lot of the stuff that I was going to raise has, has been raised by others in, in some aspects. Uh, training and guidance for businesses. Uh, I mean, I noted that HMRC recently launched um, a 50 million thing in Kent. So, I mean, in terms of businesses support here, is there something similar to that likely to happen? And then, uh, as going to be detailed in all my questions, who pays for that? Uh, you talked about the importance of the committee. Uh, and keeping us up to date and, and been having a watchful eye on the work that you're doing. The readiness report in June, will we have access to that uh, as well? And then just a few caveats to some of the questions that were already asked. Uh, I mean, products of animal origins or high risk foods. Uh, I think it was said that currently Larne and Belfast can deal with those or are prepared to deal with those. Uh, so, I mean, what happens in that case with the ports at Foyle and Moran Point? Do they have to invest in their infrastructure facilities to meet th those demands? And then just kind of following on from that, as you've said, the, the, the British government have talked about resources, but they haven't given a firm commitment. I was kind of my understanding that uh, the British Secretary of State had confirmed to local ports that uh, any additional infrastructure, uh, sorry, that additional infrastructure would be required, and that. The, the British government would pay for it. So uh, it, I was going to ask you if that was accurate, but uh, I presume I know what the answer is going to be. Well, I mean, no, no. I mean, to be to be fair, I mean, I'm sorry, I wouldn't want to be too um, stark about it because, to be fair, they have made references in the um, command document, and and in fairness, we found uh, DEFRA in particularly as a department very good to deal with. Um, and we have found that previously, when we've been going to the Treasury around issues, even prior to the resumption of the Assembly, we, we found that they were, they were actually um, helpful. So I think um, I, th I do think we will get funding. I just I suppose the point I was trying to make was there isn't a specific check. To be fair to them, there isn't a specific ask at this stage. We're just working that up. Um, to answer your question about training, not not will there be? There must be absolutely central, uh, and and uh, working with companies, and we will certainly be building that into the part of the program. Part of it's been about clarity about what we're doing. So in a sense, we're trying to do a lot of this in parallel, and I would expect that uh, I would expect that the funding for this would help with that. And also, I suppose the other piece which the minister I know would be very keen for is if there are any frictions left at the end of all of this, which have an impact on businesses, then. They should be paid for. Um, so he, he, that would be the minister's position. I think it would be fair to say, and uh, quoting him correctly. Um, I, I miss sorry the Philip the second, Just the second one was uh, reading this report in June. Yeah, I mean, happy. We're very happy to keep you up to date with any uh, anything that uh, any. We will update you on all of the issues. We've been very open with you today. Um, one of the things we do do is we'll do a gateway review. There's a thing about gateway reviews as such not being released, and the only reason for that is because it's a, it's part of project management to make sure that people feel f uh, are not afraid to say what they think. Um, so, but I can assure you, we will be happy to give you. I've t given you today the delivery assessment, and we will give you certainly a summary of the issues, so that people don't feel that they're, um, you know, that we're breaching confidences. That would be. That, but, but, um, very, very happy with that. In fact, we, we need it. To be honest with you, um, the point about foil and more on point. Um, we've had a meeting with Warren Point on Monday. Uh, you've had some initial discussions, I think, with Foyle, have you? Uh, do you want to say, Mark, or we're arranging another meeting? We're arranging another meeting with Foyle, so to pick up on your on your on your key points, uh, we're looking at the designations for all the points of entry, all the ports and and the airports, and we're looking to expand where we can um, to, to to meet that capability. And just using that example of Lauren, you know, to allow the fresh foods to come in, we need to expand that. We need to expand Belfast. And we probably need to expand Warren Point um, because I do understand, you know, from our recent evidence gathering that there are some foodstuffs coming in through Warren Point, although not as much because Belfast and Larne are pretty much the, the main key entries, you know, with 60, 70 percent coming in through Belfast, uh, and and the remainder mostly through through Larne. But again, I can provide a, a written update on, on on the detail of that um, to the committee in due course.
yeah. tra the training fill-up isn't actually as big a lift as the north-south issue, issue that we faced with no deal. The heavy lifting on an awful lot of this will happen in GB because it's those businesses who have to get the certificates, do a lot of the paperwork as far as customs are concerned to move the material into Northern Ireland. So we'll be dealing with the importing businesses, yes, but mainly with the hauliers and the ports who are already well up on this because they do international already. So they, they know the processes. So the training here compared to what we've faced with the deal is actually easier. Dare I say anything about this is easier than anything else, but it is, it, it, this, is this, this is doable. Okay, all right, Philip. Um, Chair? Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you very much for for being here today and for being so open and honest um, about what where you're at at the minute um, and for pointing out in no uncertain terms that this will not be a smooth transition um, for what we're facing. But I maybe want to go back to look at that issue of the money again and just ask you, has the work to date um, cost the Northern Ireland Executive money that hasn't come from UKG? Um, I know that you're saying there's been no check yet, but there's been a lot of work done, obviously. Um, and, and how's that working out, I, I suppose, and what's the, the, the way forward on that one? And looking at the papers here, and it, so DERA has to provide a legally binding framework, um, and that's to ensure that the unconstrained access from Northern Ireland bus businesses to, to GB. Um, but I want to ask, maybe, um, must this be compliant then with the protocol? Um, and will that be UK law? And what will that look like? And how far on are we with that? Um, and there seems to be an apparent contradiction and, uh, with the protocol under Article 5. Um, Article 5 commits to applying the EU Customs Union Code. Um, but if you can give us a wee bit more detail on that legal framework, um, why I'm asking about that is what you've been telling us today as well about the M. BP um, and the potential derogation measures that might come, and we're already, as a committee, looking at the three bills coming from Westminster, the Agriculture, Environment uh, and the Fisheries, and we're also listening to potential amendments being made there, the lower food standards and environmental standards, and I'm assuming then that if those standards are lowered, that will have an impact here then on any MVP, and that might be a fluid and ongoing thing that you know maybe five years ten years down the line if those derogations continue to happen how will that impact here and will that have an impact then on a potential legal framework that's put in place at the minute okay I th there's quite a lot there so what, I'm, what i propose to do just i think the first thing is um in terms of the resources um we have um obviously it's, it's hard to distinguish exactly because a lot of the resources that we've been putting into this are staffing resources and actually it's hard to distinguish i mean frankly uh, the, the official in official terms we've a total head count of 270 97 people working on brexit within the department and 454 eu exit posts would be our projected requirement um but actually at times it feels like we're all working on it and at times it just depends on it depends on the, the situation. Um, and actually, there's been so much has happened happened recently. So, for example, um, Mark here, who's helpfully working on on leading this and and was brought in to lead on this, has actually been helping us with some of the food security issues during the course of COVID. So, making sure that supply chains were running. So, we've just had to move people around at, at great speed, really. Uh, so, w with your agreement, what I would do though is, um, so that, with that general caveat about the people piece of it being hard to, to pin down exactly, what we'll do is, if you don't mind, I'll just take it back and just double check to see has there been any project costs that we would want to summarise in a letter, because I don't want to mislead you, just in case there's, there's other issues that maybe I'm not aware of in terms of uh, consultancy or so on. I'm not sure there will be a lot, but we'll give you a basic assessment as to the numbers of people and how that's, what, how that's impacted as best we can and do that. Uh, in terms of the legal side of it, I think, Robert, are you happy, or Norman? Do you want? Norman but just a little bit on the costs. Um, there, this, this commercially is quite complex because there's a capital cost to build something, and that, that's a very obvious thing. There's the additional costs that the industry have in order to comply. And then, in legislation, service delivered by a border control post must be full cost recovery, and that's mandatory. So the importers will be charged for SPS checks at a basically full cost recovery. And that's because the Commission wanted to be sure that every country 
was properly financing its border control posts and not putting the integrity of the union at, at risk. So there's very detail in this in, in, in Article 78 on exactly how you calculate what you charge people for the checks. And actually, normally how a border control post is built, it is built like a meat plant as a commercial operation for people to make money out of because there are fixed charges and it must at least cover its own costs, if not make a profit. So we're in an unusual position here because normally it's a, it's a, it's a private individual who comes along and builds a border control post where it's needed in order to have a commercial business. So there's a, the finances around this are really quite complicated. Uh, but at the moment, for the moment, we're concentrating on what is it that Northern Ireland needs and what do we need to ask for on the 22nd or so of, of June um, and, and how are we going to deliver it. And honestly, that's, that's almost enough. I'm Norman, just thinking you, in terms of the protocol, Norman, if you want yeah, to. I mean, <clears throat> within the protocol, I mean, I can't remember the exact words, but basically it, it says something to the effect that there's nothing within the protocol that uh, will impair the unfettered movements of good from Northern Ireland to GB. It's, it's wording to, to that effect, so that is, that is stated clearly within the protocol. So effectively what that says is uh, these matters in terms of uh, NI to GB are within the gift of UK government. And we now have a clear statement within the command paper as to the position of UK government uh, when it comes to movements of goods from NI to GB. Uh, so we have a pretty clear position uh, laid out uh, within that now. Yeah. Um, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank Dennis and Robert and Norman for coming. It uh, looks to me, tell me if I got it right, I mean, goods produced in Northern Ireland go into the UK, there's no checks, is that right? Okay. Goods produced in the in you can't come to Northern Ireland either way, there's no checks, is that right? No. <laughs> the checks coming from the eligible goods for SPS coming from GB into Northern Ireland are subject to the full body of EU checks. So they're coming to? to? Into Northern Ireland. That's what all these border control posts are about. Okay. But they're subject to documentary um, identity and then a percentage to physical checks. What's that percentage? Percentage is again laid down in legislation. It depends what it is. Live animals is 100 percent physical checks. Yeah, but that's the same today. Uh, no. No. At the moment, there's there's no there's checks on live animals, isn't it? Checks on live animals, but those are are almost an agreement, an independent agreement between GB veterinary authorities and myself. Yeah. Allowing me to protect Northern Ireland. Good. This is different, and these are now official controls mm -hmm. and part of regulatory checks. So they move into this legislation uh, with all we've talked about. Uh, and uh, Northern Ireland, at its point of entry, having to do the same as Dublin, Calais, or any other point of entry into the European Union. That, that's what it is. Not a massive amount of land animals, is it? But li li um, if I talk a moment, Mark will have the figure. I'm sure it is fingertips somewhere with the consignments of live animals. It's one of the volumes that we've done. Um, but it's no, it, it's not. No, I, I wouldn't have thought and so. Neither are horses. Um, but as you know, William, at the right time of the year, bulls coming on, bulls in particular coming from Scotland to Northern Ireland. If I was to say they couldn't come, would not be a very popular conclusion. Absolutely not. Um, so it's, there's a not. Uh, it's not always the independent individual value of this tr the trade that matters. The social aspects to this too. So uh, currently, the checks that are acquired under this, you're right are almost exactly the same, except in this case, we have to follow the letter of the law here, and we would have to charge for them. Yeah, I, I think just if I could just add in, it might be worth just a couple of, there's a couple of extracts from the command paper to make the point. They've, they've said some checks will be needed. It's the UKG's position. Some checks will be needed supported by relevant electronic processes in line with the island of Ireland's existing status as a single epidemiological unit, which I think is what you were, what you were getting yeah. at. Building on what already happens at ports like Larn and Belfast. And then it talks about the proposals. But importantly, one of the things it does say, the process by which controls are conducted and their frequency, including the level of physical checks required, 
will need to be discussed with the EU in the, with, uh, in the with, Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee within the context of the provision in the protocol that both parties must use their best endeavours to avoid controls at Northern Ireland ports as far as possible and adopt recommendations in the Committee accordingly. Um, we will actively seek to simplify and minimise electronic documentary requirements for this trade. So it's just to say, I suppose that's, that's where the political side of this comes in, and that's one of the reasons I think the Minister was very keen to hold out until we got a clear line from UKG, which would make that as helpful as possible. I think he would have preferred maybe something even better than that, but that's uh, as, as political negotiations go. But that's, that's uh, one of the reassurances that's been given as far as it, as a, as far as it goes. So, Chair, live animals are quite a nice illustration of this. So, this book basically says that I have to do a 100% certification check. That happens now and will happen in any case. Well, it's all true, yeah. Um, there will have to be a 100% identity check to make sure that these are cattle and there's cattle in the cert and they're the same cattle. You'd expect that. The place where, the, where that will be described in negotiation is what percentage will have to have an actual physical check, will have to be unloaded and inspected. And this book says 100%, but the free trade may, agreement may say none, or something in between. And that's the difficulty we have in planning, in that we're trying to plan and build and think of processes without knowing what that number is. Is it 100% or nothing? Otherwise, I know everything. You may have to erect a cattle crusher. And the way that Mark has got around that is that we have described a reasonable worst case scenario, and that's what we're planning against. That you have to have a plan. Okay. Um, hey, good. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of processors, beef processors, are quite near where I live, and uh, they import a lot of um, dead cattle from the Irish Republic and process them here. And then we go on, of course, to the UK market. What's the scenario in that case? On check. Yeah, uh, this comes back to the issue of uh, what's the definition of a qualifying good, and that still has to be defined uh, by UK government. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that's what uh, uh, we have to uh, await. Uh, so, what is the definition of a good, a qualifying good? Because it's a qualifying good that enjoys completely unfettered access from Northern Ireland to GB. And so we needed to see that definition before we know then, does it extend into the raw materials that were used to produce that good, and where did those raw materials come from? So we don't have that part of the jigsaw uh, in place yet. Okay. Uh, just, just before I finish, what I'm getting is uh, what you're saying, all, are you saying that all goods, a percentage of all goods coming from the UK or through the UK to Northern Ireland has to be checked. All eligible goods under SPS will have a certificate. The certificate will be checked and the identity will be checked. But that's very fast. That's what I would and yeah. it, it, we're hoping that our processes will streamline that to make it basically a nod past a booth. Right past a booth. Your documents looked at, you checked, customs check, clear you, off you go. Um, but well, I'm sure, is there not already good scones from outside the UK into Northern Ireland? There are, yep. and, they, and they get there under this, but yep. not fresh food. Only frozen, frozen food is the only food that is checked coming into Northern Ireland. And that would be Even from a third country? That's third country. So it would be non-EU? It's non-EU. It would go through that process at the minute. And that works fairly well? Yeah, but it's yeah. Not, not, not large volumes, obviously. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Morris, can you hear us, sir? Do you want to come in? Okay, I'll, I'll just Morris sent in a message by text then. Um, the uh, he, he questioned Morris's question about the the, the, the time trail. Obviously, there's doesn't appear there's no there's going to be no extension to the transition period. Um, is the time timetable available uh, to achieve this? Apart from the ports and airports, is there any plans for border controls anywhere in any other uh, locations? And will there be an opportunity for the committee to visit one of these new uh, posts when they are completed? That's from Morris Bradley. 
Well, I, I, I suppose the, the main thing is uh, we've talked about the points of entry. Um, I mean, it's uh, the, the EU legislation talks about border control posts, and I, I think that's the point I was making about there's a difference. That's a term that's used for designation. We're talking about designating existing points of entry. So the intention is not to build entirely new facilities, uh, although we have to scope all of this out. The, inter the, the, co scope, the idea is really just to... to um, enhance existing or extend in some cases and uh, to get uh, EU approval um, so that they're designated um, as border control posts. There's, not, there's no uh, intention to do anything other than that. I don't know if Robert has any doubt that. No. Was there a second part? But the possibility of visiting one, I suppose. But I can't see why not. There was, there's, there's, I think the committee's visited. I, I don't know if the committee's had an opportunity to visit one of the others, uh, the no. existing ones yet. But certainly, I, I can't see off the top of my head why not. It was, was listed, wasn't it, to do a visit one of the ports? But obviously, COVID not, and all of the other challenges has kicked in. Um, I'm not sure I could stop you if I wanted to. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> I'm going to ask Robert. Just going to ask you a question, Robert. One of the um, What's been mooted uh, quite recently that there's going to be a need for uh, a lot of extra vets. What is our vet new capacity? Do we have enough here? Um, wh where will they be based? And, and the, another thing that just, was just happened, I got a, a constituency referral just recently there, uh, of a young woman who wants to go, has been accepted to become a vet in a university, but because she has a previous degree in another discipline, she, is not get, she can't access the required... Uh, um, support that she needs for for um, going to university yeah. to be a vet. So, what, what's the situation with vets? Um, I have what I have. There's no cavalry coming over the hill. Um, this is a good time to tell the secretary that I commenced a new competition for vets yesterday. He's going to ask me about head count and embarrassing things like that. But going again, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have to plan with what I've got. But it will mean that I may have to take resource off other places to do it. There you go. Now I'll use. I'm going to use my normal um, technique, which is that vets will do what vets have to do, and they'll be supported by court inspectors to do the things that they don't have to do in law. Um, and that's my group staff cadre. And again, uh, we have what we have, and that's what we're going to try and work to. So the processes have to fit in with that. But I, I think we can get past. And I, I keep coming back to the, the earlier challenge of north-south controls and issuing certificates. The, the hill is not half as high as that one was. Um, it's a lot of an easier lift from afar, as far as resources are concerned because it's all in set places. It's at the border control posts. Uh, it's not throughout. And we will have some resource required for attestation veterinary certificates for some material going going. Um, from Northern Ireland to GB, for example, material going on to another third country. So if meat was going from, for example, pork going from here to GB to go on to China, that would have to have attestations uh, to go with it, to take it from a third country then into China. So we'll, there'll be some work um, in, in that, but I think the resource is okay. On the, on the student wanted to do veterinary, I answered the letter yesterday. <laughs> And unfortunately, there is there is no resource for that. Um, it's a, it's not an unusual situation. Looking at fees um, that we usually think of being having to be paid by Americans or other foreign students having to be paid by somebody to go to do a second degree in the realms of twenty twenty five thousand a year, um, it, it it almost makes it impossible. Uh, but unfortunately, there's. There's no fund into which I could dip, despite my, my sympathy with her position. Sorry, not a good place to end. Ask me a nice question, I can give you a nice answer to it. <laughs> uh, sorry, Claire, you're looking. Thank you, just come back in again. Um, thanks. Uh, I'd be curious to know, so I'm going to go back to those three bills and how they impact on the, the protocol and, and going forward. And we know that there's going to be common framework set up um, across the regions with um, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales uh, and England, and there's been no mention really of those uh, at the minute. So I maybe wanted to ask, are ERA being given any 
positions um, on any of the specialist committees that will be set up and what priorities will you have um, those are what access to which committees um, you will be if any getting on to uh, and how many of those common frameworks are the department working through um, and working on um, and do any of those that, that you know of so far do they intersect or clash with the, the protocol and is it possible that we can get a look at any of those Maybe Norman, if you're happy. Yeah, after that. Um, actually, yes, we are involved uh, in the common frameworks, um, and uh, it's a, another large area of work across all of the UK. Uh, so uh, again, uh, because of where we are, uh, all administrations facing the same challenge of finite resource and limited time. Uh, so there is a pri has been a prioritisation of the frameworks. Uh, I think there's is it six or seven or something are prioritised that we will uh, seek to achieve by the end of this year and then other ones that will also will seek to achieve as much progress as we can uh, by the end of this year and then finish them off uh, as quickly uh, there, uh, thereafter as, as possible. So yes, they do interse intersect with the uh, protocol. Some do, some don't. Uh, so we, that's part of the process. We need to ensure that the, the, the framework uh, does recognise and deal with the, the consequences of the protocol. So there may be aspects uh, of the internal UK framework uh, that effectively relates to GB only, because it doesn't, but as, as I, I've said no more than three hours ago uh, in, in our video conference with our colleagues in other parts of uh, the UK, because it may be a GB element does not mean we have no interest. Uh, and that fact uh, was, was very clearly understood um, so yes, there is an intersect there. In terms of the, the question around uh, the bills, um, so um, I suppose possibly in the agriculture one, uh, which is obviously the one that I, I am familiar with, uh, there is no uh, intersect uh, per se uh, with, with the protocol, uh, or no significant uh, intersect with the protocol. Uh, but again, it's like all these things, there's always going to be something in the detail uh, that, that catches you out. Uh, but for the most part, the Agriculture Bill is about setting our support, internal support framework uh, for Northern Ireland, and that is a completely devolved matter. Uh, and it's a matter on which the protocol, all it says is in terms of there will be an envelope uh, in which we can spend. Uh, so it's a, a basic state aid carve out for the funding that we will put towards agriculture. Uh, that has to be set uh, under protocol. Um, and within that, uh, the proportion of that, that uh, must be green box compliant uh, under WTO. So other than that, uh, the protocol uh, then doesn't actually uh, impinge uh, with, on the agricultural support uh, agenda for Northern Ireland. And are you all, is the department on any of the specialist committees? Have not located spaces on any uh, under the uh, under the protocol. Yeah. Um, no, we, we the specialist working groups have not been established yet, um, and we'd certainly like to have uh, an involvement uh, in, in those. Um, the specialised committee, I think, has met once. I think so far, I'm about to meet again, um, and there, there's there is a Northern Ireland representation on that. Uh, but when it comes to the, the, the working groups, I think that's where we would have a, because uh, that's where much of the, the detailed work will be done. That's where we would have a, obviously, a clear interest in having a seat at the table if we can. And we're certainly asking for that. Who will determine if you can? I suppose ultimately uh, it's, it's an international negotiation, uh, and therefore uh, Whitehall leads on all international negotiations. So ultimately, it will be Whitehall uh, will make that call. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Just for finish up here, then um, one of the objectives that's noted in the paper um, is clear and consistent messaging with your stakeholders. H how has that been achieved, and are they? What's their state of readiness for this? I think I think that's been a huge problem, to be honest, uh, because just I suppose until we get um, until we we're in a good position now and that we can we can have conversations and we brought our stakeholders in. As I say, we have stakeholders in every week uh, for COVID. 
Um, and so we can use that now and use the clarity that we've got just in the way we're doing today to be able to say, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, and here's what you need to be thinking about. I think um, that, as, as Robert says, what's, what's really helpful about this situation is that it's maybe not as complicated as it would have been, say, under the previous scenarios we were working at um, with Brexit. So that makes it a bit easier for businesses here. But I think it's been uh, a problem that we haven't been able to have that conversation in a, in just because we haven't had the clarity about what basis we're working on. But now we have a very, very clear mandate and we are and will. I mean, really, we've hit the ground running straight away and had people into meetings and we've been very open in the same way as we have today about where we are. So that process has begun, but we need to do a lot more of it. And. Um and just uh, this is I just noted this from the the, the briefing provided by Shauna for the EU Affairs Manager, um, and maybe Norman might answer this question. It's, it's not quite connected to the rule. It is connected to protocol. That the Joint Committee they can determine the maximum level of agriculture support for farmers here. How, how how does that interface with the the schedule for here for on the agriculture bill? Yeah. So uh, that sets a. Uh, a state aid carve out so we can spend up to that limit uh, with full state aid cover um, and then within that there's a, um, a limit on the proportion of that total that needs to be green box compliant. Um, so other than that, uh, that gives us uh, permission to spend up to that. It doesn't provide us any budget, uh, it mm. just gives us state aid cover um, and then within that uh, it's the, the schedule within the Agriculture Bill then gives us the permission to actually shape the policy that we will implement within that spend, spending permission. Yeah. Um, so Is that the head space that we refer to? Effectively, the headroom. Yeah. 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 Head yeah. yeah. So you, you've got the, the state aid uh, carve out. Uh, the Agriculture Bill provides the policy framework, uh, and then ultimately, Treasury will provide the funds. So. Bring the three together, and you've got your your your, your agricultural support uh, that will be applied. Uh, but you need each of each all three of those elements uh, in place to do that. Well, you're in there. Just, uh, something I meant to ask earlier and forgot. In their paper, the British government said they won't, there's no need for customs checks at the port. Or does that, or where are they likely to take place? It's going to be on the boats or? Well, I suppose it depends on the direction we're talking about. There'll be customs checks coming across because they'll, uh, you know, again, for the reasons that was talked about earlier, some of the products will be going through our ports and straight into the EU. Um, so the, the, that's where that's where they'll be and uh, customs located. Where we're out working that out, Philip, because it, as I described, in order to do our our SPS checks, we rely on and work very closely with HMRC. That stood out for me. HMRC aren't there. I have serious problems with my process. Um, that, that's a conversation that we yet to have as to actually how they intend to carry out their duties. If, as they say says in the protocol, <coughs> they aren't actually physically in the port. So the only truthful answer is here: we haven't clear yet. But a good spot. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Are you looking then for something else there? Or no. Oh, that was a, from it earlier. So, folks, is there any other questions before we? Okay. Well, no other questions, anyway. So, again, I want to like the, take the opportunity to thank you very much for coming today, Mark, Dennis, Robert, and Norman. Um, very comprehensive briefing, and very uh, informative, and fully answered uh, uh, answers to the questions and. I'll be very stood up about stuff as well, about your and your answers as well. So thank you very much, and no doubt we'll be engaging with you as this unravels. Okay. Okay. Chair, could I have your permission to yeah, take a okay. photograph from the staff of your exemplary social, social distancing? <laughs> <laughs> there we are. I have a core brief to write for tomorrow. A picture for it. You'd remind you this this was broadcast online anyway, Robert. Oh, so the whole country's not going to know. <laughs> Things. So, uh, actually, you, I don't imagine the viewing figures will be that. <laughs> if you can me help in some of my, man my management techniques, I'll very much appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank Thank you so very much. That was very helpful. All the best. Nice. Safe home. Okay. okay. So, folks, item number four on today's 
agenda is the Sea, uh, sea Fishing Industry um, Scheme 2020. The correspondence from the Department at page 47 advises that a previous SR the Committee considered in April now has to be amended due to the examiner's statutory rules alerting the Department to an incorrect reference in the definition of length overall within Article 2 of the rule. This is a minor technical amendment which the Department will back, bring back before the Committee in due course. A copy of the SR is on page 48, alongside the explanatory matter, memorandum at 53 and the SL5 at 56. Sorry. Are members okay to note that? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Members okay to start rule to proceed? To proceed? Yeah. 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 Okay with that start rule to proceed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can we move to uh, item 6 to 10 next and consider uh, agenda item 5 in closed session at the end of the meeting? Okay, so six correspondence. Uh, correspondence page 73 to 74, your pack. I want you to draw your attention to the correspondence from the Ulster World at pages 109 and 113, in which they have written to the Minister regarding the collapse in the global world uh, market. Also, we have requested that the information they have provided remains confidential and is for committee information only and not to be shared. Are members okay to action the correspondence received as suggested on the index sheet? Okay. Our work programme, uh, it's in pages 162 to 164. Stella, do you want to take us through the forward work programme? Yeah, um, just again very quickly. So next week will hopefully be our first meeting by Starley. That we are down for room 30. That will start at 10.30 um, a.m. Now, what that means is it will be a hybrid meeting, so um, the chair and myself and um, up to, I think, three other members can be in the room. So you need to let me know which, is this, which members want to be there. And then we will bring the rest of the uh, members in by um, Starleaf. So it, you will be on the screen and broadcast. It will not be teleconferencing. The caveat is this will be the first week when it'll be used. This will be the first time we'll have used it. So we're we're hoping that it all goes according to plan on on that. So um we will we will see where it goes. I'll chat to you um individually, I'll send you out an, an email about who wants to be in the in the room and who wants to come in by Starleaf. Okay. Um that's the eleventh of June. So that will be our um, first committee experience of it. That will be the working with Barbara on the dear officials will be in to answer your queries on the Environment Bill. As you know, when Barbara took you through the Environment Bill last week, there was a number of big issues raised. So this is your chance to have another discussion on those big issues with the dear officials before the report is finalised okay. and the monitoring round. Um, will be there as well. The 18th of June is another informal meeting at the minute. 24th of June is a meeting in the Senate here. It will be to do the, the DERA business plan and you'll be getting a raised paper on the protocol. 25th of June is the meeting with the House of Lords and I will probably organise sometime again on the 24th of June an informal round robin with the committee um, before we go into that meeting so that you are clear what you want to say and what questions you want to ask. Um, so I'll probably organise that maybe in, in the morning of the 24th. Um, 1st of July, again that's a Wednesday, we're here back in the Senate for the meeting with Minister Poots before summer recess on COVID-19 and COVID-19 and exit and recovery um, as well as anything else that's ongoing and probably on any other issue that you want to raise, and I would imagine Brexit will be top of that agenda. We also have an offer from, again, probably the same officials you spoke to today, for another informal briefing, so that would be informal using Starleaf, on EU exit preparations, not just the protocol. So we heard about common frameworks. You also heard a little bit about the, all the policy. Mm -hmm. The agricultural policy, the environment policy, the rural development policy, all the new policies that need developed because of EU exit, waste, the new waste policies, you um, also about um, the budget, so where is the budget for farming support coming from, all that kind of stuff. So not just the protocol but all the other EU exit matters. That offer is for Thursday the 2nd of July. It'll be by Starleaf, so we try and do it in the morning. 
So um, if you are happy with that, we can try and get it set up. But again, it'll be a briefing like this here, probably two hours, just behind closed doors, you know, focused on the everything to do with EU exit, not just the protocol. Okay. So if, if you're happy to do that on the 2nd of July. That's important. Yeah. Very serious issue. Yeah. And you'll also hear a bit about um, that meeting, the, the other one that I didn't mention there, which will be take up most of your time, believe it or not, will be the legislative programme coming forward. There's just there'll be massive amount of legislation required between September and December to get the transition ready to get that statute, the rule book, in place. And um, you know, we'll start to need to sort of try and figure out when's it coming. Is it going to be evenly spread over those three or four months, or is it all going to come in one big comp at the end? Um, so, well, you know, all the, the, the legislation as well. So that, if that's OK, I'll organise that for you. OK, Stella, thank you. Um, remember, we have any other business before we move to the closed session? Okay, so the date and time next meeting is next Thursday, 11th of June, um, in room 30, uh, Parliament Buildings. That's yeah. the Starley form, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. So, meeting ended. Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland...